So what exactly happens? So deoxygenated blood is the venous return. It is taken away from the body and it is pumped into the cardiopulmonary bypass machine and the oxygenated blood is returned back to the blood. So here, this process, which sounds pretty simple, occurs at various levels using various components of the cardiopulmonary bypass machine. So what are the components? So the first is the pump. The pump takes over the function of the heart. Next is something called as oxygenator. I'll show pictures of individual parts of this as we go along. Next is the oxygenator. This is like the lung and it is going to conduct the gas exchange function of the lung. Third is the circuits. So circuits are like pipes or tubes or like our great arteries. It will direct the venous blood into the oxygenator for it to get oxygenated. And then these pipes or tubes, what we call as circuits, will take this oxygenated blood and give it back into the systemic circulation. So this is the third part. Fourth is the prime. So we don't keep an empty cardiopulmonary bypass machine. We first prime it or fill it with some sort of a fluid. And this will go into the oxygenator and to the circuits prior to cardiopulmonary bypass. Now, if we are operating on an adult patient, mostly it's a crystalloid prime. But if we are operating on children, as you all can imagine, we need to have a better or tighter control of the oncotic pressure. Uh, so for that reason, we use the colloid. So the fluid can either be crystalloid or it can be colloid. Crystalloid mostly in uh, adults. In little grown-up kids, like say maybe 10, 12 years, we use a mixture of crystalloid and colloid. But let's say we are doing a neonate or an infant, or maybe lesser weight or age babies, we definitely go for a complete colloid uh, priming. So colloid can be blunt or it can be FFP or it can be albumin. These are the choices that we have for prime. So we fill the fluid into the prime. I mean, we prime it up to the oxygenator and the circuits prior to establishing the cardiopulmonary bypass. So this is a scheme of the CPB circuit. Uh, sorry, I don't think a pointer will work here, but I can tell you how it can be traced. So now if you follow the blue line, you can see that it is connected to the right atrium here for the ease of understanding. Maybe if I zoom, it will be easier. So there's a blue line coming out of the right atrium. So if we don't need to open the right atrium, then this is one option. Otherwise, if we need to open the right atrium, like say we want to close the atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect, repair a tetralogy of fallow, any of those things, you can see blue tubes above and below that, so which is the superior and inferior vena cava. So uh, in those, we put the cannulae, but the bottom line is the blue line carries the deoxygenated blood into what is called as the reservoir. You see this is the reservoir. So from the reservoir, blood is pumped into the oxygenator and heat exchanger. The heat exchanger, you can see that water port connected there. So that gets connected to the heat exchanger, which is here to your extreme right. It says water and heat exchanger. So this will keep warming and cooling the blood as required. But otherwise, this blood is going into the oxygenator. It gets oxygenated and there is a filter here, this ALF is the filter. Before it goes back into the heart, you know, when we take blood from uh, the heart, there could be some small debris because it's not just that we are sucking from the right atrium or SVC or IVC. You can see that there is something called a suction. This will be held in the assistant or surgeon's hand and we keep sucking the field, that is the pericardium. So there can be some debris in it which can also go into the venous reservoir. So we need to be, make sure that there is no debris when we give it back into the aorta. Otherwise, as you can imagine, there will be particulate embolism. And because it goes into the aorta, it can go into any part of the body, causing ischemia or stroke. So a fully filtered blood will go back into the aorta. So the other components are pump suction. As you can see, the suction. Then you have root vent. 
uh, which we connect to the aortic root. So blood keeps coming back from there as well. And maybe to the LV vent, how many ever vents? Totally three are their options. We can connect all of this. So any blood that is lost in the field is not really lost outside. It gets sucked into one of these three pumps or uh, it will venous, go into the venous reservoir and go into the oxygenator for oxygenation. So finally, this is the circuit and blood keeps going inside this closed circuit. So we have an oxygenator, like I showed you. There's a heat exchanger, there's a reservoir, filter, suction, vents, and there's something called as cardioplegia delivery system. If you see this K plus, that's potassium. So that's a cardioplegia delivery system. So I will come to it a little later. So that's also a component. So this is the scheme of CPB circuit. I think this we already know that venous blood is intercepted as it returns to the right atrium and it is diverted through the venous line of the CPB circuit to a venous reservoir, as I showed in the diagram. Next is the arterial pump. It functions as an artificial heart. It will withdraw blood from the reservoir and it propels it through a heat exchanger, which I showed you and then into the oxygenator, which is like the artificial lung. And then it goes into a filter and the arterial line uh, into the patient's arterial system, which is generally the aorta. Like you saw in the pictures, additional pumps and components are used to assist the surgery so that no blood is lost. And also the heart has to be decompressed at all times. Even though we are on cardiopulmonary bypass, the heart keeps receiving some amount of blood so we don't want to keep the heart getting distended, like you all know about Frank Starling's uh, law. So within physiological limits, it's okay. But beyond that, if it uh, stretches, it causes irreversible myocardial injury. So to prevent that, we keep de decompressing the heart. And finally is the cardioplegia delivery system. So these are the blood tubings, which I was talking to you about, as you can see on the right side. So venous and arterial tubings are all here and they're used to connect the various components that is venous and arterial components and divert the blood out of the patient into the pump or from the pump back into the patient's vascular system. The newer ones are heparin coated. So they're more friendly to the patient in terms of lysis of blood. So we use various types or sizes of tubings and uh, these are made of PVCs. So the sizes can be three by sixteen, quarter and half inch. So this size varies according to the size of the patient and the BSA, which we calculate using the height and weight of the patient. We try to keep the length of the tubing as minimum as possible because we want to reduce the priming volume because we know that the priming volume will be diluting the patient most of the time and also to prevent hemolysis. So in this schematic representation, I showed you a venous reservoir, that is the blood from the right atrium was getting diverted into the venous reservoir. So this is a picture of a venous reservoir. It has a stand and we connect it to the cardiopulmonary bypass. So we usually position it between the venous line and the arterial pump. So they're made of hard plastic shells and they're graduated. So we can know how much uh, volume is coming from the patient and the perfusionist has to maintain a minimum volume in order to give a particular type of flow to the patient. So arterial pumps are used to replace the uh, pumping function of the heart like I told you. So now there are two types of pumps. There's a roller pump and a centrifugal pump. So both of them are traumatic to the blood cells but comparatively centrifugal pumps are less traumatic than roller pumps. So this is a photo of roller pump on your left and centrifugal pump on the right. So roller pump, so let's see how it works. So there is this circle or like a roll which keeps turning on itself. And then you can see this pipe. So there is this whole tubing which is set inside this roller pump and then the pump starts rolling. As you can see on the extreme right, this pump head is now touching that tubing. So it positively displaces the 
fluid which is inside by occluding it at a particular point. So the first the occlusion occurs in a point in the tubing and then it starts rolling. So it positively starts displacing the fluid and the fluid keeps going along because the fluid is now forced to move in the tubing in a forward direction. Okay. While this is happening, simultaneously, blood gets drawn from the uh, circuits and the reservoir into this pump. So as the fluid moves forward, the fluid that is behind keeps getting sucked into this pump. So this is the mechanism of the roller pump. Now these are centrifugal pumps. These are non-occlusive. There is no occlusion like in this figure A, as you can see, it occludes. But in B and C, as you're seeing, there is no occlusion here. So you can imagine it is less traumatic, right? So what happens is there is a high magnetic coupling which occurs. Uh, I mean, the kinetic pump is generated by the magnetic coupling because of high speed revolution that happens inside. So it keeps evolving and then takes the blood inside and moves it forward. So these are called as fins and uh, or we call them channels and it is present inside a cone that cone is a disposable cone so we have to keep this pump inside and then the centrifugal pump keeps working in that particular manner so the other component is the heat exchanger so we need to manage the patient's body temperature or the blood temperature so whenever we operate in order to have a bloodless field we try to cool down the patient. So not only it helps to reduce the return of the blood into the heart, it also reduces the metabolic demand. So for every degree that we cool the patient, seven to 10% of the uh, metabolic rate drops. So that's how we can cool down the patient significantly without causing any end, end organ damage. So we do that with a heat exchanger. It can be used either to reduce the temperature or it can be used to rewarm the patient after the completion of the surgery. And also another function of this heat exchanger is to reduce or cool the temperature of the cardioplegia solution. So generally we give blood cardioplegia in children and we want to give it at about 4 degrees centigrade. So it is cooled down to that level. So it's a zoomed in photo of the heat exchanger all the way down that you see. So topmost is the reservoir and bottommost is the heat exchanger. Next comes the oxygenator. That is the lung of the patient while he or she is on the cardiopulmonary bypass. So it performs the essential function of gas exchange. And here oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange takes place. So you can see that it is labeled. The topmost, the blue you see is the venous blood inlet. So once it comes in, there are vents and ports for cardiotomy. That's all the suction, whatever we do, all the blood comes back here. There is no blood loss. And then as I told you, it is graduated. So you can see the level. And next you can see the outlet. Whatever blood is received, now it has to flow out as an outlet uh, for further uh, into the uh, pumping, I mean the filter and back into the heart. So I will talk about one of the type of the oxygenator, which is the membrane oxygenator. So this is used when CPP is needed for more than two to three hours. So gas will not come in direct contact with the blood. So there is a membrane, something like your dialysis membrane. It's made of silicon rubber or polypropylene or maybe even Teflon. It will separate the blood and gas compartments. And here the blood is, we make the blood to flow in these hollow fibers or thin sheets over this membrane. While it is flowing, carbon dioxide will diffuse outward and oxygen will diffuse into the blood. So this is a photo of another oxygenator. So where does this oxygenator get the gas from? So we have oxygen supply in the theater. And so one of the gas inlets is connected to that. So that's how the oxygenator gets its supply. So this is a filter, the arterial line filter. Like I told you, we don't want any debris, clot or anything to enter the aortic uh, circulation. 
So these filters are placed in the arterial line. And this is the last component through which blood has to flow before it will go back into the patient. So it's about 20 to 40 microns are the size. So that's how small the particle matter which can be filtered. And uh, by filtering the particulate matter and even gaseous microemboli, it makes it more safe for the patient to prevent embolic strokes. Thank <laughs> you.